and would like to call this house to order. Welcome to the quarterfinals of the Fourth Asia World Schools Debating Championship. Contesting this round are WSTC Philippines and Proposition and Team Bangladesh 2 on Opposition. The motion on the floor is Peace House believes that the international community should abandon the war on drugs, definition verification, cross border drug enforcement operation. Without any further ado, I would like to call on the first proposition speaker to open the debate. The war on drugs is not an ex a war against an immediate existential threat, but a war against some of the most vulnerable people in society and those that may need our help most. That's why on proposition side, we reject the current war on drugs, and we, that's why we think the international community should abandon the war on drugs. What do we mean by this? By the international community, we're obviously referring to all the countries in the world, and, the effort, and by war on drugs, we're talking about the international effort and initiative to destroy the drug trade and the chain of supply of drugs. This includes processes like sending enforcement agencies abroad to different countries, such as the United States does with the DEA in places in South America. It also supports punitive and immense cracking down on the drug problem and extremely harsh punishments in all areas of the world in any part of the drug supply chain. What do we support instead? We support a total abandonment of the current situation with the war on drugs. We support decriminalizing both the use and sale of drugs in all areas around the world. Furthermore, the same money that they use to promote the war on drugs, the tens of millions of dollars they have, we will relocate it into both locally and internationally building rehabilitative centers, as well as community development, providing alternative sources of income for people who sell these drugs. I'm going to talk about two things in my speech today. Why the war on drugs is principally unjustified, and why, irrespective of this principal principle reason, why it's an ineffective war. Firstly, why this war on drugs is principally unjustified. We need to ask ourselves, when are wars justified? We think there's two main reasons why they're justified. One, when they are proportional with respect to the harm you do upon individuals with, in relation to the harm that can be done to you. This happens in two instances, both with respect to the cost you have in terms of investing tens of millions of dollars and the, and the armed bank powers you use, but also the human cost in terms of the innocent lives that are lost and the people you kill in this war. But secondly, we think wars are also only justified when it is used as a last resort. Why? Because wars are so necessarily violent and extreme that we must reasonably pursue other strategies to prevent these harms, especially when these harms are so great, such as to constitute the loss of life, the destruction of entire communities. For example, we think historically we try to exhaust all other options before we pursue, a, pursue war, for instance, through dis diplomacy or things like sanctions. We think wars are only justified when they're used as the last resort in order to protect yourself from an existential threat. So then why does this war fail to meet that standard? Firstly, I'm going to talk about proportionality. If we trace the war on drugs from its inception in the 1950s and 60s to what it's done today, we think many of the world countries around the world have spent tens of millions of dollars and multiple countless thousands of man hours to little to no benefit today. We think in many instances of actually, such as, such as the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia, where you have the triangle between Laos, Thailand, and other nations, the drug trade has actually increased. We think I've been completely ineffective to that regard. But equally, we think the human cost is much more worse, specifically because you target so many innocents that die in this war. Two innocents we're talking about, both in terms of collateral damage that occurs. Because we think when you initiate this extremely punitive and harsh war on drugs, there are people who die in the crossfire. For instance, in the Philippines, the war on drugs that was created by Duterte, so far has been, it, it been acknowledged by Amnesty International that over hundreds of children have died as collateral damage. But even if we completely ignore absolute innocence, we still think they harm innocence, and it's not a proportional response to the harm upon you. Why? Because we think many people who are involved in the drug trade, such as mules, for instance, or low-level dealers, aren't actually, aren't actually, aren't, isn't justified in punishing them this way. Why? Because there's multiple coercive elements that push them into this situation, such as socioeconomic structures that force them to pursue jobs because there's no other opportunities available for them. On the other hand, no thank you, our model provides these very opportunities through community development. But what is the harm of drugs? Because we need to weigh this proportionality of harm with the benefit that the war on drugs supposedly gives. 
We think in the very worst case, the drugs may debilitate individuals and they may cause some wider societal problems. But we think even if we accept that these problems will completely exist, it's still much worse than punishing these people with long prison sentences at the very least, or multiple or thousands of deaths at the worst case scenarios of not only innocent, not only the people involved in the drug trade that were coerced, but multiple innocent bystanders. But we think on our side we're also able to mitigate the harms of drugs. So this proportionality doesn't actually balance out on their side, because when we have things like community development and things like rehabilitative centers, we're better able to mitigate the, the harms that drugs may cause. And I'll be explaining this in my second point. But on the second standard, I'll take you in a second or last resort. We don't think all other avenues were exhausted in this case. We think when the war on drugs was accepted in the 1950s and 60s, people jumped straight to this violent war against drugs without utilizing other methods, such as our model, which is much less extreme and violent. And we think can work and has been proven to work in multiple scenarios. Hence, it's principally unjustified because it fails to carry, it fails as a la it's not used as a last resort and it creates a huge cost that is not in proportion with any benefit it brings. But before I move on to my second point, go ahead. Because there is collateral damage to something like an intervention to take out ISIS, do you also reject supporting that policy? We told you it's about proportionality. We told you why even in your best case scenario, the proportion is still not there because of the thousands of people that die, not only as completely innocent collateral damage, but we also told you people already involved in the drug supply chain. For example, mules who are coerced into the situation. For example, low-level dealers who can't find the ability to opt out because you heavily criminalize this and they, can't, they fear coming out to the state. We think they completely, that POI ignored my entire point. Moving on to my second argument about why this is an ineffective strategy, even if they can say it's principally just. Because we need to understand, because we, we think that the war on drugs has ultimately failed. Why does it fail? We think there's multiple reasons. We think these drug enforcement agencies, international, have limited support or ground support. In many places where the drug trade is booming, such as in Colombia in the past and other instances, the communities where these drug trades are based often have lots of support for these drug lords because these lords provide the very services that they need, state services. For example, El well, Chapo builds schools and hospitals. On our model, when we provide this community development and rehabilitative access, we're able to access this very same ground support that they deny. But secondly, we think there's a huge information disparity that exists in cross-border enforcement. When many of these international agencies lack the very specialized and needed, need, very needed knowledge on the local populace. But furthermore, we think militarization begets militarization. When you actively demonize these people who have many instances have been coerced because of socioeconomic, socioeconomic situations or become addicted through no fault of their own, we think you create more people to fight against you rather than less. And this leads to the final reason why we alienate the people, we, the very people we need. Firstly, in terms of drug addicts, we think drug addicts are unable to come forward and try to cease their addiction and cease the contribution to the problem when you criminalize their very nature. But furthermore, we think it extends to drug dealers as well, because we think that all, not all drug dealers are especially violent. But the point at which you criminalize them, you, lack, you give them a lack of opt-out mechanism, but they don't want to engage in more violent things, because they're locked into it because they're afraid of the law. That's why, for instance, when people join gangs or cults, they're often locked in because they can't come to the state for support, because you criminalize them and they don't have that incentive to come forward. Even if you are able to shut down these places, however, we think we think this drug problem will simply pop up in other places. Because we told you, what are the core reasons for the drug problem? We think there are coercive socioeconomic structures that force you into the drug trade or make you become, become, addicted, become addicted. That's why the Golden Triangle in Asia, like I told you, Thailand and Laos, is also one of the poorest regions here. We think, therefore, we think, therefore, that other spots will pop up to take the place of the places you shut down, even if you are successful, because it's such a lucrative business, and because of the war on drugs, ignores the fundamental core root of the problem. What is the comparative on our side? We succeed because we tackle the very reasons why their policy fails. In terms of ground support and the socioeconomic structures, we think our policy of community development and rehabilitation gives you the opportunity not only to opt out of the situation and come toward the state, but also gives you the ability to earn income in alternate spots. Like in northern Thailand, where community development programs were able to allow people to opt out of the opium trade, decreasing production by as much as 90%. In terms of information, we also think people are more likely to come forward when they're not being criminalized and demonized by these drug enforcement agencies and this cross-border enforcement. But, but furthermore, we think we think this is manifest in like Portugal, where decriminalization has led to a decrease in drug abuse and a decrease in crime. We think on our side, we take this, uh, we think on our side, we've shown you why it's principally unjustified to continue this war, and we, we think irrespective of that, the war is ineffective in the first place. Very proud of you.
it is abhorrent to refuse to help a sufferer who is asking for your problem. Behind this team stance, Team Bangladesh is very proud to oppose this motion. What do we want from this particular debate? We want to have war on drugs in not in an extreme way that they would want to picture in this debate the most convenient thing ever possible. Currently, they don't realize the context we're living in. How does war on drugs happen in modern world? You share intelligence, you share resources, personal for helping local authorities fight the war on drugs. Second, for example, the United States of America doesn't sell the entire defense force to do intervene in that country. They send DEA agents who can help collaborate with the government agencies and solve this problem. We are all right, we stand for this sort of things. Second, what is our third? What is our burden in this debate? Our burden is to prove to you why this is necessary and on principle levels we will tell you why that happens and secondly why this is the effective solution. And finally, their burden had to uh, should show in this debate why essentially their alternative would work, which they made a very weird attempt. Let's engage with them first. Let's look at their alternative. They gave the most ideal alternative ever. They want community development, they want rehabilitation, they want to assimilate the Avengers for the next mission. Sure, we want all of that to happen. That's cute. But in an ideal world, it's difficult for that to happen. So why, why is it essentially difficult for that to happen? Because if these individuals are not people who are standing there saying, oh, we are doing something wrong, take us down. These people have paramilitary forces who are willing to fight against the government, who are willing to shoot people if they disobey them. These are people who are willing to rape people skin them alive in front of their peers and parents to make sure they have a reign of fear existent in these areas. These are the people who are dedicated and passionate individuals who want to make sure, no thank you, want to make sure they go to the extremest of the levels possible to make sure their drug that they treat as diamond is getting across and they're getting money in this particular world. So don't come up and give a convenient context that doesn't work and an alternative that is so wishy-washy in this debate. Second, their problem is lives are being lost at this point in time. I have four responses to this. First, what we do at this point in time, due to international intervention by uh, community, is first, we provide immediate relief. How does this happen? When you go ahead and give the victims immediate relief, that is when individuals have more incentive to return in the short term, when they realize they have some place to go to, because the government, otherwise, government they realize government cannot help them, and they stay back, even when they realize they can, this, the work they're doing is essentially very, very wrong. Second, the ability to fight turtles better. Why? Because international community, has international community has better weapons and they have better ability to deal with these things. Sir, we are individuals of international community have more personal at this point in time. What does this mean? Often in these cases, the drug cartels have, have certain moles inside the defense and inside the military. They can have a lot of influence and knowledge about the military of the local government. That is why the local governments often do not work. That is when you need this as the only solution that comes in and makes sure these things are dealt with. Third, fourth, they have better trading. For example, coming up with the idea of decapitation, that if you take the leader down, then the collateral damage can be reduced at a large level compared to that happened before when local governments simply went out with guns and started shooting people. That happens under our model because we have sharing intelligence and sharing ideas of strategy that improve military bases of the countries that are developed have done. So we reduce these collateral damages under our world and we make sure lives are safe. But again, the alternative, what is the alternative in their world if these interventions don't happen? These people will definitely be killed by the individuals and by of the drug cartels, raped, and make sure they obey these individuals at a, what every single cost. And we think if they're willing to concede that harm, it's immoral to say if five individuals die in a collateral damage because we want to save that in society that is in ruins, and that is something they consider as big of a harm. We think they're contradictory. And finally, the idea is to individuals who are good and want to come back, they are being killed. We don't think so. Because if your characterization is, these individuals are the people who are good people, who want to come back, we are all right for forgiving individuals who want to come back and we are all right with providing rehabilitation that can exist under our model as well. We don't think that is exclusive. And finally, if the drug cartels that are less violent in nature are the ones who essentially do not need that much of a violent attack to begin with, to take down. So we don't think that idea stands as well. In conclusion, in a world of wishy-washy ideas, the alternative that they provide, they eventually, uh, the underlying message that they give us is they support drug cartels regardless of what happens. Yes. Sir, do you support the current drug wars at work to heavily criminalize drugs? The reason drug war is successful is because we have a narrative 
that the, the drug use is absolutely abhorrent. And that is the message that unites individuals regardless of the condition they're in. We are very proud to stand behind this line. What is the first justification that I'm going to provide? First, why is this a justified method to be taken by the international community? First, because victims are enslaved. Why is this problematic? Because these individuals, they have zero autonomy when the cartel has full power over them by fear of killing, torturing loved ones with impunity. That is the first reason that the enslavement occurs in these areas and we have the right to make sure these people are free. Second, we make sure that this, uh, this essentially cannot be allowed to happen. Why? Because it's our moral duty to prevent severe human rights abuses. Second, autonomy and ability to even make a bare minimum effort to save lives of individuals is essential at this point in time. In conclusion, we have enough justification to prove why this should happen regardless of anything that they come up and talk about. They need to challenge our idea and say, oh, it's not okay to save human lives. Second, we move on to the idea of why is it important to give an authority, an alternative authority, and that only happens under our model. And it's very important, Mr. Speaker, understand this. We agree to their idea that these individuals don't go to these drug cartels because they believe in their ideology. These individuals are poor, and these individuals don't have the ability to stand for themselves. They're left out by the state, not because the state hates them, but because the state has, the state has bled dry by fighting against these drug cartels. These states don't have the resources and intelligence to go against these organized criminals at this point in time. That is why, Mr. Speaker, uh, dear panel, we essentially make sure that this, uh, this is a necessity. But finally, we also, so we consider that idea that definitely, yes, these people need this. But why does this play under our model better? Because under their model, right now, drug cartels are the only authoritative figure in their world. These are the only people who can help them get a proper life, get some form of agency. What do we change in the short term? In the short term, we make sure that we set the narrative with justice and we make sure we have a right authority. That means we take lives of people who killed their father, who murdered their parents. That is why, in conclusion, in short term, we give them protection. But what do we do in the long term? In the long term, we make sure we set a narrative where government forces and international forces enter the houses of these drug cartels with guns blazing and saying that, guess what? You are not invincible. Guess what? You are not the godlike figure that you portray yourself to be and you can essentially be taken down. Why is this narrative so very important? Because in the long term, you need to think about these vulnerable individuals, Ms. Man uh, dear panel. These individuals are the ones who are made to believe drug cartels are the only solution in their life because their farmlands were burnt. They didn't have an opportunity to even grow crops in their land. These individuals, the family was killed and shown they were invincible. Nobody challenged their authority. This is the point in time. We challenge their authority and we make sure this happens. What is the impact of this? First, People believe that the tough life is a life as a legitimate choice to make. Because it's easy when you're hungry every day to enter a drug cartel and live for the day. It's tough to go ahead and pursue education and think about the long term. It's tough to take a low paid job which is honest. It's tough to take government facility at this point in time. That happens under our model. You go ahead and take the tough step because you hope there is a future. That is when your kids are sent to school because present is important because future has hope. Only it's under our model. We should win.